that beautiful little baby girl and their family. And so uh, we are looking forward to that very, very much. Just briefly before I jump in the message, I want to say thanks to those who showed up yesterday for our work day. Uh, we got a lot done around here. If you haven't noticed, the pavilion is completed. That is, our part of the pavilion is completed. It is about 28 years I stood under it while it was raining today, and there were no leaks. So uh, that is terrific. Uh, Midweek this week's uh, cement should go in. And uh, either by the weekend or the first of next week, the landscape will be finished in the front part. And uh, we actually should be using it on Easter Sunday morning. Yeah. So we are very, very excited about that. We also did some other chores around here. We were kind of small in numbers on our work day yesterday, but they were valued. And so uh, we got a lot done. So those who were able to make it, we say thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, good to get some spring cleaning done around here. We are in what chapter today? Ten. Turn to chapter 10, if you would, if you brought the story with you. I believe that is page 129. If you brought a regular Bible with you, we are in the book of 1 Samuel today. I'll try to give the uh, locations and addresses in both of those. If you're visiting with us today, we are doing a 31-week uh, study of the Bible. We are using a book, which is all of Scripture. There's no addition to this, but the Scripture is called The Story. Is an abridged, short version of the Bible, putting it in chronological, sequential order, eliminating the duplications, and uh, uh, not in, it eliminates some things, and I don't want to say unimportant, because some of the stuff that, that, that's not in here is very, very important, but uh, they're trying to show us the thread of redemption, the continuous flow of the story. And so we are taking 31 weeks, all right, doing our best not to take a shortcut, that gets us through the scriptures, so we could say at the end of, uh, of uh, eight months, all right, almost eight full months, that we have been through the Bible from beginning to end, and that should give us a pretty good foundation. It's never too late to join us. You can pick up copies of these at Majesty from now until next Monday. They're $14.95. A week from tomorrow, they'll be five bucks. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm waiting a week to Monday, all right, to pick my copy up now. Uh, they'll be on sale at Majesty for $5 the week of Easter. And uh, most of them are not, not this particular one, but the hardback version of the story. Uh, where will you be reading next week? Uh, chapter 11. How many of you read chapter 10 this week? Did you do this on? Oh, look, you guys are awesome. All right, awesome. Thanks for keeping up. We are one-third of the way, and the Scripture gives us some wonderful direction right now. Do not grow weary in well-doing. Don't get bored, all right? We're a society that gets bored very, very quickly. If it's not, it's not, in fact, I talked with a pastor a few weeks ago. I said, I heard you did the story in eight weeks. He said, yeah, people get bored if you stay on one subject too long. I said, I'm so sorry. I said, I, I, said, I don't know about you, but there really is only one subject I preach every Sunday. And I said, his name is Jesus. And I said, whether it's Genesis or Exodus, Leviticus or Numbers or Deuteronomy, if we don't preach Jesus, so I said, I hope they don't get bored with Jesus. Uh, but, but that's our challenge. But one of the reasons our society is so biblically illiterate is because we don't have the patience to do that stuff which is most meaningful to us. And I believe this is one of the most meaningful things we've ever done at New Hope, is to preach through the Bible during the course of the adventure of this year. And thank you for jumping on board. And if you are just joining us and would like to get caught up gradually, we don't expect you to do it all in one week or two, but you can go to the website and you can download the audio sermons from every one of the weeks, or you can go there and download the visual and watch and listen. It's available in both formats. And then on Wednesday nights, after the Sunday morning message, we do a Q&A time at 7 o'clock over in the other building. There's 45 to 55 of us who join every week, and uh, we attempt to, uh, together, answer questions that come up as a result of our study, our reading, the previous week. The psalmist exhorts us to meditate on the scriptures how often? Day and night. And that word for meditate is the Hebrew word haga. And it carries the image of reading the scriptures like a dog chewing on a bone. I ought to hear a lot of growling today, all right? That's the kind of ferociousness that you and I should approach the study of the scriptures every time we open it, read it, study it, or listen to it. 
And I hope you and I today will dive into the story and chew on it like a dog chews on a bone. I don't know about your dog, but my English Springer Spaniel, when I give him a bone, all right, one of those rawhide bones to chew on, when I go back later, it's gone. He has not just chewed on it, he has digested it. And I hope that you and I today will chew on this portion of the story, digest it for our own benefit. The key idea today is distortion. The key idea that we're going to discover today has to do with the word distortion. Webster defines distortion in the following way. To twist something out of its original shape. I don't know if you've seen that computer program on the, uh, on the IMAX that you take your picture and it can distort your facial images. Uh, I played with this today. Let's, uh, let's take a look. This is one photograph of me uh, all right, uh, in, in distort mode. All right? And then there's a couple more. Just move on. I think you have to click on them. Uh, an alien pastor. Okay. Ooh, there's a frog face pastor. All right. Uh, well, maybe that's the frog face. Maybe that was just a fat face. Oh, and there's the pastor who's in love with his wife. Oh. All right. I, I didn't do anything bad this week to score points. Just uh, it's, it's, it's always good to store up. All right, you do too what I do. All right. Uh, the thing I worried most about showing you those distorted was somebody would say, "I like that one better." All right, that, that had me worried. You see, we can distort a human face to look humorous or terrifying. And as we come to the story in 1 Samuel, we're going to examine three major distortions. We are going to look at, at how phoniness distorts life. We're going to look at how worldly conformity distorts our Christian influence. And we're going to look at how misrepresentation of the truth distorts our Christian testimony. You see, major distortions mess up this perfect picture that God wants to set <coughs> to the world through his people. God put Israel together as a nation for what purpose? So that other nations would look at them and discover who God was. You and I who are Christians today, we're part of his people now called the church. And the intent of God working through the church is for this, is that other people will look at God's children and they will discover who God is. It's not to discover who Tim Rowland is. It's not to discover who New Hope is. It is to discover who Jesus Christ is. Through our journey of the story, we have been reminded that there is a upper story and a lower story taking place simultaneously. The upper story is about God's relentless pursuit for redemption of his people like you and me. God wants to spend time with us. That's the upper story perspective. And then there is a lower story that goes on. And these are individual lives and the events in our individual lives that happen to us that occur in the course of history. And the question for us is, are we so preoccupied with lower story living that we lose sight of upper story perspective? It is important for us to keep in mind that these two stories are going on simultaneously in our life, whether we notice it or not. The upper story of God's redemptive work continues its march through history. There's also the work that he is wanting to do in our personal lives, in our distinct and different circumstances that we encounter. And guys like Bob, whether they're deer hunting or facing the, the, the kidney surgeon, whether it is... Uh, the, the, the adventure of the Carr and Smith family dedicating this healthy, beautiful baby, or whether it's the Harmon family whose grandchild is in the ICU unit of Valley Children's Hospital battling botulism. Whatever the circumstances are, God says, in the midst of your lower story <coughs> events, I am going to be with you. What happens when we dwell in the lower story? and we lose sight or we ignore upper story perspective and purpose, when we only live with a focus of a lower story, we become self-reliant, we become selfish, and we become self-absorbed. It becomes all about my needs, my problems, my situations, my timing. God certainly cares about us because 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. 
But there is a higher place for us to live in the lower story that will keep us out of unnecessary despair, discouragement, and depression. And that's when we remember in the midst of our lower story issues, there is an upper story purpose still going on. We're going to look at a section of the scripture that is a tragic tale of a man who could not see beyond his lower story living. He became self-absorbed. He became egotistical. He was so narcissistic and so driven by notoriety and addicted to all that kind of stuff that he couldn't see himself living above the lower story. He fell, and he fell hard. King Saul, who we will look at as one of our characters in the study today, once stood so tall, and unfortunately, he fell so hard. Leading up to King Saul's story, 1 Samuel actually begins with a person who's not born yet. 1 Samuel is going to begin with some background material about a guy who 1 Samuel is named after. His name is Samuel. Samuel was a, a unique man. He was the last of the judges that we studied just two weeks ago. Remember before Ruth, we were in the book of Judges and we looked at Samson and Deborah and, and a few of the other judges in that time period. Well, the last judge who is going to serve in that capacity is this baby who's not been born yet. His name is Samuel. Samuel is not only going to be the last judge, but he's going to be the very first one to serve in the role as a prophet. Much of the rest of the Old Testament is written by the prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Joel, Michael, they have all prophets. And Samuel is the first of that specific assignment that God gives to the role of those who will be known as prophets. <laughs> now, we're going to get a backdrop of these three major distortions. Phoniness, worldly conformity, and misrepresentation of the truth in the early chapters of the book of 1 Samuel. As we begin to look at a character named Elkanah and Ephraim, who had two wives. Their names are Hannah and Penina. Hannah was barren, she was childless, and she was heartbroken. Benina purposely provoked Hannah's pain. Women have an ability to do that with other women. Sometimes I'm candid. They know. I'm going to get myself a deep <laughs> There is a difference between men and women. And men have a tendency. They, they, we tend not to do those kind of things as a rule. All right? But, but have you ever. Do you remember. Did any of you grow. Let me slow down. <laughs> I'm also trying to find a way to bail water real quick. <laughs> Any of you raised on a farm or your grandparents had a farm and they had chickens? Did you ever watch what a couple of old hens would do to each other? Okay, they'd just pick each other bare. They'd, they'd find a sore spot and they just just pluck, 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 pluck till that chicken's nearly naked. Okay? Just, just to be, and, and sometimes, when, we, when you live only in the lower story, my wife's shaking her head at me. I haven't done too good at it yet. <laughs> good thing I showed those hearts over my head. Right? Uh, but, but sometimes, lower story, both men and women, all right? But we can, we, we find somebody in a vulnerable place, and we just pick and pick and pick and pick. And that was what Nina did to Hannah. And, and Shiloh, and Shiloh was where the tabernacle rested uh, that represented the presence of God in the nation of Israel. Hannah, the one who was childless, prayed to God for a child, promising to give that child back to be raised, to be used of God. And I believe that is why Samuel was the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. His mother had committed him to the Lord. God hears Hannah's prayer, and Samuel, whose name means God has heard. Isn't that a great name for Samuel? He is born and is dedicated to God in the service at the tabernacle. But along the way, some major distortions are going to come, and it's going to distort people's perspective of what God wants to do. There's a story of a man who was on, uh, on the ocean in a huge yacht. They had cruised for days, and though they had done this many, many other times and never gotten lost on this particular trip, they found themselves lost at sea. The captain noticed that the owner's young son had placed his toy magnet near the casing around the compass. And the magnet force of that toy had distorted the readings on that specialized equipment called the compass on the yacht. 
The trusted compass was, was working properly, but the bag that placed near it distorted the real direction they traveled, and they ended up lost. You and I must be careful not to fall for the enemy's distortions of phoniness, of conformity to the world, and of misrepresentation to the truth. And the way we avoid that is by knowing God's word and applying those truths to our own lives. So as 1 Samuel begins, Samuel's not been born, and we read the wonderful story about Hannah and his mother, who, who is going to become his mother. Hannah was married to a man who had two wives. The two wives, Penina and Hannah, now, i got to be honest, marriage seems challenging enough between two people. I find it really frustrating when you got three involved there, all right? I, I have never understood the excitement about polygamy. <laughs> Quite frankly, I have always thought that a one-person marriage had the best chance of survival. <laughs> a few more of you got that in this service, in the eight o'clock service, yeah. You see, polygamy was a problem in that day. God didn't condone it, he didn't endorse it, he didn't honor it, but many of Israel did it anyway. While Penina had children in this marriage, Hannah did not. Her womb was barren, and that is where the book of 1 Samuel begins. The barrenness of Hannah's womb is also symbolic of what's going on in the spiritual condition of Israel at the time. The people to whom God has been faithful again and again over the centuries has found themselves in a state of spiritual barrenness, of moral barrenness, and of infertility. To give you a little historical perspective of where we are in this upper story, we are coming to a new era in the nation of Israel. We have just finished the time of establishing the promised land. We are coming to the era of the kings. 2,000 years before Christ, God called Abraham and he made him three promises. He said to Abraham, through your seed, I am going to give you a great nation. I am going to give your nation a home, land to live on. And I am going to bless all the nations of the world through you as I send a king from your offspring. The first promise of the great nation will be fulfilled 600 years later when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and they became an established independent nation of their own. When Moses died, he was replaced by Joshua. Joshua. Good. That was only four weeks ago. <laughs> he took the nation into the land of Canaan and the promised land that God had promised them. So now God has fulfilled his second promise. They would have a homeland. For 25 years, Joshua was their leader and there was peace in the land. Then Joshua died. The nation then living in the promised land went into a rapid spiritual decline. The book of Judges that we looked at two weeks ago is that 300 to 330 year history of the moral, spiritual, and political collapse of the nation of Israel. We read again and again and again and again, the people did evil in the sight of the Lord. There is very little leadership in Israel except for some local judges whom God raises up to bring about deliverance for a period of time. It was a time of violence, a time of corruption, a time of anarchy, families falling apart, nation has no leader, the nation has no king, and all that is going on is reflected in Hannah's barrenness as we begin 1 Samuel chapter 1. God touches Hannah's womb and she gives birth to Samuel. And out of gratitude and worship and out of a promise she made to God, she gives Samuel back to the Lord. She takes him to Eli the priest, and Samuel will be raised in the household of Eli. It is here, that's the background to these three major distortions in the rest of 1 Samuel. We're now going to begin a closer look at each of those distortions. And the first distortion is that of phoniness. And it starts... When Hannah brings Samuel to be cared for under the roof of Eli. i got to tell you, if I was a parent and I had to bring my son to Eli to be raised, though he was the preacher, I would have been terrified to have done that. Because though he might be a fine priest, he was a lousy dad. You see, at Shiloh, the priest was Eli. Before he was given Samuel as an adopted son, he had two sons of his own, Hophni and Phinehas. And they were horrible sons. They were priests as well because they were, were sons of Eli. 
They abused the sacrificial system. They committed sexual and immoral acts. Eli refused to reprimand his sons, and God judged them all. You see, the thing we need to learn about this, and we're going to take a closer look, but let me give you the application first so you can think about it as we talk about the specifics. You and I cannot just have an outward appearance of faith. We must be genuine on the inside. We must be authentic. We don't have to be perfect. But we must live what we believe. At Fresno State Baseball Great Games, that group of self-appointed cheerleaders I talked about a few weeks ago, uh, they not only pick on the opposing team and the, uh, and the umpires at the game, but they also pick on each other. Okay? And so if somebody from that fan section in the stands gets up and leaves before the game is over, and most of the time when fans do that, it's because your team's getting beat, and so they'd rather go home than watch the ongoing misery. Well, this group of self-appointed cheerleaders, when they see somebody, somebody leaving in the seventh or eighth inning before it's over, they say, don't leave, believe. Yes, I had to hear it about three times before I figured out what they say. Oh, believe in your team. Don't give up before it's over, you know? It's not over until the fat lady sings, all right? It's not over until the final bitch is made. Stay in there. Believe. And that is our challenge here. Be authentic. Don't leave your faith. Don't ignore your God. Believe. The first seven chapters of 1 Samuel predominantly tell us the story of Israel's fall and decay and spiritual barrenness. The Ark of God, the place represented where God's name is, and it's a picture that God dwells in their midst. It was stolen by the Philistines. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli the priest, uh, who were also priests, were very wicked boys. They used the priesthood for their own gain. People would come to bring temple offerings, and they would extort it from them and put it in their own pocket. They would use violence if necessary to steal from the people. They would misuse the offerings for themselves. Hophni and Phinehas slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting, abusing their spiritual authority over these women. Even more tragic than the so-called spiritual leaders is the fact that their dad, Eli, doesn't do anything about it. There is no discipline. There is no confrontation. He doesn't remove them from the priesthood. He doesn't ask them for a time out. He sacrifices the spiritual health of the entire nation because he doesn't deal with the pain of confronting those who to, are to, to assume leadership after his death. He lacks the courage and the fortitude, and because of this unwillingness, the priesthood is removed from Eli's family. When Eli's grandson is born, do you know what his daughter-in-law names his grandson? Ichabod. Ichabod. They made movies by that name. That name never is a name put in good light. And in fact, there's a reference that one day God may have to write Ichabod over the door of the church. Because what Ichabod means is the glory has departed. God's presence is gone. You see, Israel reaches one of the moments, lowest moments in history. We got upper story and lower story going on at the very same time. As 1 Samuel begins in chapter 8, that's found on page 135 of the story. If you want to turn to 135, we're going to read a passage from there. It's the second paragraph that begins with so. Samuel is now an old man. He now has his own sons who he's appointed to follow him as judges. But quite frankly, his own sons don't turn out to be the pillar of humility and righteousness either. But, but remember... <coughs> Samuel learned his parenting skills from Eli. Okay? Now, Eli, as a priest, was a good priest. Samuel, as a judge and a prophet, was a good judge and a prophet. But Eli and Samuel both fell a little short in the fatherhood category. And so, Samuel didn't learn a whole lot about fatherhood from Eli, and his kids didn't turn out too well either. So the people are tired of the judges. They're in moral decay, spiritual decay. It's a troubled nation. And so the people come to Samuel and ask him to give them a king. And this is going to be the second distortion. You see, from Eli and his kids and Samuel's kids, we learn how phoniness distorts the image of God to the other nations around them. 
The second distortion is that of worldly conformity. The people ask Samuel to anoint them a king so that they can be like other nations. God tells Samuel the people are not rejecting him, but they're rejecting God. And the application in this area is don't aim to be like everybody else. God's people are to be distinct. Doesn't mean we're weird, just different. We're not called to be exactly like others. We're intended to live a life that reflects God's presence so that others would want what we have rather than us chasing what others have. So, look at page 135, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, if you have a full Bible, and notice what it says. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, You are old! And I don't want you all to get any ideas, okay? <laughs> we love you, Samuel, but you're old. You're not going to be around forever. And your sons, they don't walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us so that we will be like other nations. That request to, be, to have a king displeased Samuel. I want you to notice something for a quick moment. Even the judge and the prophet, even the pastor, can come sometimes forget about upper story perspective, and we can get caught up in lower story circumstances. And Samuel did. Samuel heard Israel say, we want a king. And Samuel took that personally, that they didn't like him as a judge. And God has to let him know, Samuel, it's not all about you. You ever been there? Anybody ever said that to you? This is not all about you? Okay. And the Lord said, this is found in verses 7 through 9, also page 135 in the story. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying. It's not you they have rejected. They have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me, serving other gods, now they're, they're, they're doing it to you. Listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know that the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights to do it. Now there's sin going on here, and it's not that the people ask for a king. God had anticipated their need for a king. And it's through a line of the king that the king of kings is going to come from the upper story purpose of the Bible. God's redemptive work will be fulfilled. That's the third promise given to Abraham. That there would be a king who would come and bless the world. That was not their sin in wanting a king. The sin, sin was that they said to their maker and they said to their redeemer and they said to their deliverer God, we want to be like what? <laughs> Other nations. God wanted his people to be different so that other nations looked at them and said, we want to be like y'all. And instead, the y'all wanted to be like the other nations. And that is what Father God said was they wanted to be like everybody else. They rejected God as king. Samuel called this an evil thing and great wickedness. And so, we've seen two distortions. Distortion of phoniness by Eli and his sons. We're seeing the distortion of conformity to the world by the people as they clamor for a king. And that brings us to the third distortion, misrepresentation of truth. God is going to allow the people to have a king under his permissive will, though it was not God's perfect will. All right? A little doctrine going on here now. Let me ask you a quick question. It's just right off the cuff. No explanations. Would you rather be under God's permissive will or under God's perfect will? I didn't hear you. Yes. Okay, those of you who said perfect, that's a good guess. You did absolutely right. Some of you are still thinking about that. You see, permissive will. Uh, God was a gracious father. God gave to all of us freedom of choice. And so under freedom of choice, we can sometimes ask our Heavenly Father again and again and again for something. And He may say, no, no, no. He may say, wait, wait, wait. But we can keep persisting and God may say, okay, I'm going to give it to you. And more often than not, when we find those examples in the Scripture, the end result of God's permissive will turned out to be devastating for those who ask for it. God's perfect will 
is always the best. Samuel is going to anoint Saul, who will be empowered by the Spirit to defeat the Ammonites. Saul will disobey God by, by not obeying God's command specifically. And God will then reject Saul as a king of Israel. And he will take away that place uh, of kingship from Saul's family. And David is going to be chosen. But that's another chapter. Finally, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, it finally doesn't mean I'm not finished. Finally, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, we come to the story of Saul. It's kind of the typical story of a young, up-and-coming guy. He was busy with his dad building the family business. His father had a donkey business. Doesn't that excite you? Wouldn't you like to be the heir apparent to a donkey business? Saul so probably had dreamed that his life one day would be taking over the donkey business. He would be chief donkey in the business. <laughs> I, I, as I read this, and I can't go there, but I'll just say, do you remember when we were kids? And, and I mean, we, we didn't have computers. We didn't have all the TV with, with 500 stations on it. I mean, we had limited things. We had to be creative with our entertainment. And so as boys at about, at about 8, 9, maybe 10, one of the things that somehow got devised was picking up a telephone, and those were rotary phones in those days, and we would just dial a number. We didn't know what number, we just dialed a number, and somebody would answer, and then you would make up a story and see how long you could. Did any of you ever do that? Come on, we're in church, confession's good, all right. Well, there was one that we used to say, is this so-and-so's fuel farm, and they would say no, and then you would respond with something I can't say in church, and that's what I thought of when I thought of Saul the donkey business. You see, God, in order to get Saul's attention, you know what God does? I, I, I love this. I love this. God has a sense of humor. God plays hide and seek with Saul using his donkeys. He hides Saul's donkeys, and they can't find him. A big search goes out, and he comes up empty. And so one of Saul's servants says to Saul, hey, let's go to Samuel. He's a prophet. Let's see if he's any good. See if he knows where your donkeys are. Well, to Saul's amazement, when he shows up and knocks on Samuel's door, Samuel's got a banquet feast all ready for Saul. He says, Saul, come on in. Dinner's ready. I had this part. How'd you know I was coming? I'm a prophet. <laughs> so, they have this wonderful dinner. And in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1, it's on page 137 of the story. It's 137, 137, uh, second to the last paragraph. <coughs> then Samuel took a flask. Hold on. Of olive oil. And he poured it on Saul's head. And he kissed him. And he said, has not the Lord anointed you ruler over this inheritance? He said, what's going on here? You see, prior to this occasion, in the story preceding where we are right now, there's only been two occasions of anointing take place. One of them is for priests. They were anointed as they stepped into the role of priest. And the sanctuary, the tabernacle, was anointed as being set aside to represent God's presence. Anointing with oil is a symbol of the pouring out of God's spirit on someone or some event. It is a sign of God's approval and symbolic that God's presence is here. God is showing Saul in a very picturesque way that his pleasure is going to rest on him as he fits into his permissive will to become the first king of Israel. Now Saul was reluctant to take this on. In fact, he was so reluctant, Saul didn't go out and tell anybody about this little incident or about the assignment that he had been given. He was interested in what he wanted to do with his life. Let me pause right there. Does that ever sound like you? Interested in doing what you want to do regardless of what God may be calling you for? You might be, you might be living in his permissive will, but not his perfect will. He wanted to take over the family donkey business. When the time came for the public coronation of the new king, the first king, this is a big moment. The announcement is going to be made to the whole people who God has chosen because nobody knew at that point except for Samuel and Saul. Saul was hiding. And do you know where he was hiding? He was hiding amongst the baggage, the luggage. Can you imagine next January we'll be inaugurating a new president? It's inauguration day. 
I didn't say new necessarily in the current <laughs> or our current one. Just it'll be a new reign uh, for four years. <laughs> <laughs> Deep trouble all the way around. They're looking, can you imagine, it's Inauguration Day, and they're looking for the president to inaugurate him, and they can't find him, they can't find him, and all of a sudden, one of the, one of the guys who works in the White House, Secret Service guys, they find the soon-to-be-inaugurated president hiding in a clothes closet. What are you doing there? I don't want to be president. That was Saul. <laughs> Finally, God, God helped them find Saul, just as he helped Saul find the donkeys. There might be a parallel meeting there. Saul was hiding because he was trying to avoid the call. At 30 years of age, Saul was now crowned king. And there was a great war for the, roar from the people. And they said, what a king we have! What a king! And you know why they said that? Because when Saul stood up tall, he was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. He was the biggest guy. That, he had that look of Brad Pitt. <laughs> Am I reflecting it at all? <laughs> I do. That's, that's called distortion, all right? But he was a wise man in many ways, and at the beginning of his kingship, uh, he ruled fair-mindedly with justice. As a king, it didn't take long before Saul had his first big victory. There was some trouble up north with the Ammonites, and so King Saul sends word out to all the people, and 36,000 people respond to be his army, and they have a great victory over the Ammonites. Saul was thinking, man, this king stuff's not bad after all. I put out the word, people respond. I say jump, they say Ammonite. That kind of power can be addicting. After that victory with the Ammonites, something starts to shift in Saul. Israel's at war now with the Philistines. The Philistines are a major world power. This would be like the Dominican Republic going up against the United States, a little nation against a major nation. The Israelites are outnumbered 13 to 1 by the Philistines. The Philistines gather 36,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, a multitude of people so vast they can't count how big their army is. King Saul realized this is a precise job. And so he puts the word out, expecting 36,000 to show up like the last time. But some of those 36,000 have heard how big the Philistine army is, and this time, guess how many show up? 3,000. He waits for more. The more doesn't come. Realizing he's up a creek and he doesn't have even one paddle, he sends for Samuel the prophet. Now we need the God guy. Samuel tells him, go to Gilgal and wait there. Wait for me to come. When I come, I am going to give a burnt offering and sacrifice to the Lord. Wait till I get there. That's the instructions to Saul on how to prepare for a battle with the Philistines. Gilgal, the place of remembrance, sacrifice, wait. So Saul went to Gilgal and he waited and he waited and he waited. And as he waited, he watched soldiers slip away and go home. 3,000 dwindled to 2,000, 2,000 dwindled to 600. <clears throat> By this time, Saul was starting to get impatient, and he must have forgot his history lesson about getting it. Samuel has not shown up. Saul is a man of action, and after all, he's the king, so he gets things done. So after five or six days of waiting, even though he's instructed to wait, instead of following the instructions of God's prophet, he takes upon himself to offer the burnt offering. Just as he finished the offering, guess who shows up? Samuel. He is a stern-faced prophet, and he says, what you been doing? So I said, well, I waited for you, but when I saw the people dwindling and going back to their home, I thought I needed to take care of this myself. I mean, after all, I'm the king, and that's what kings do. We take action in crisis, we fill in the gap, and so I decided to make the offering myself. I knew we couldn't dare go into battle without this kind of sacrifice, so I did it myself. Now, if you look at page 152 of the story, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, here is Samuel's response to Saul, as Saul makes his excuse. And it starts on page 142 with a word, but. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. Now it's prophesied that Saul's kingdom is going to be taken away from him. A successor would replace him. And the successor would be a man who had the heart of God in him. And eventually we'll find out next week that is David. <laughs> now in spite of their odds against the Philistines, and in spite of Saul's disobedience, through Jonathan his son's faith, God gave a great victory to live in Israel of, uh, over the Philistines. And now we come to the place where God brings Saul to his knees and he gives him one last chance. 
And I don't want to pass by that over, over the question. Saul has been disobedient. God is removing his future as Saul saw it from him. But God is offering to Saul with grace another chance to finish well. To finish well. In spite of all that Saul has done. There's more. We read the whole story. Don't have time for it today. But in spite of all of Saul's rebellion, seeking direction from a witch, this disobedience, God says, Saul, I'm going to give you another chance to finish well. Samuel said to Saul, I am the Lord, I am the one the Lord sent to you, king over his people. So listen to the message from God. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as we came up from Egypt. Hundreds of years before, they had been waylaid as Moses was delivering them. And God said to Moses, remember the Amalekites, never make peace with them. Now he says to Saul, go attack the Amalekites. Destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men, women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and... Donkey. Oh, man! Don't you know that had to hurt Saul when he said donkeys? <laughs> God tells them to totally annihilate, wipe out everything. So what does obedience look like to Saul? Page 143, 1 Samuel 15, 7 through 9. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with a sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the best of the cattle and the fat calves and the lambs and everything that was good. These were unwilling to be destroyed, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. And what did God tell Saul to destroy? Everything. And what did Saul destroy? Everything except, except, except. Saul thought that he could find something good and something that God had declared bad. Saul arrogantly thought he deserved some of the spoils. Remember, lower story perspective now in Saul's life. It's all about me. After all, he was king. Should there be some perks to being king? The Bible says in James 4, 6, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was England's best-known preacher of the second half of the 19th century. At the age of 20, he became pastor of New Park Street Chapel, one of London's most famous churches. He was pastor there for 38 years. Tens of thousands of people came to Christ there in his ministry. 200 new churches were started. He founded a pastor's college, an orphanage, a Christian literature society, and a Christian magazine. He frequently preached to audiences that numbered 10,000 on a Sunday with no microphone, only his voice. So what was his perspective about success and obedience? Success, he said, exposes a man to the pressures of people and tempts him to hold on to his gains by fleshly methods and practices and to let himself be ruled wholly by the dictatorial demands of incessant expansion. Success can go to my head, Spurgeon said, and it will unless I remember that it is God who accomplishes the work and that it's God who continues to do so without my help and he will be able to make out without me being around. God doesn't need me. And he doesn't have to use you. He wants to. He wants to. I think he saw and read so, read so many of his press clippings that he forgot God was involved. He forgot God could do without him. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. After this great military victory by the Israelites over the Amalekites, we're given an opportunity to see the very heart of God. 1 Samuel 15 says, Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I am grieved that I have made Saul king because he's turned away from me and he's not carried out my instructions. God says, I'm sorry I made Saul king. He's not obeying me. Didn't God say the same thing at Noah's time? Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm sorry I created man and I'll wipe them all out. What happened at the bottom of, of, of Mount Sinai where the people of Israel had just fashioned a golden calf while God was giving to Moses his direction and his leadership called the Ten Commandments? <coughs> God wanted to wipe Israel out right then. He was sorry because of the sorry actions of the people he sacrificed and given so much for. 
Samuel gets up early in the morning to go confront Saul about his disobedience. And you know what he learns while he's on his way there? He learns that Saul has erected a monument. <coughs> he's built a statue of who? God himself. Not to the God who chose him and empowered him, but he made one to himself. That's what pagan kings did to proclaim their own deity. Remember what Israel said? We want a king so we can be like other nations. And Saul was giving them what they asked for. They were truly now like other nations. A king wanting to be God. The scripture said pride goes before destruction. Samuel confronts Saul and he says, What you been doing, Saul? I'm doing wonderful, Samuel. Thanks for asking. I've done everything that God asked me to do. I killed the Amalekites. I destroyed everything, just as God said. And just as he said that sentence, all of a sudden, Saul and Samuel heard, Samuel mm -hmm. said, what's that noise? Saul said, what noise? I can't hear anything. That noise of cows, the lowing of cows. Oh, oh, well, that wasn't my idea, Samuel. The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord our God. Who had he just made a statue of? It's funny. He doesn't just use the words we destroy. He says we totally destroy. Misrepresentation of the truth. But we're going to do it for sacrifice. He's putting a spin on it. Saul's already learned how to be a politician. He's going to put a good spin on it. Oh, I wasn't thinking the best for me. It's about God. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the heads of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you, and you did not obey. Saul, God has sent his spirit to be with you. Now your name really ought to be Ichabod. Ichabod. The words that follow may be some of the most important words ever uttered in history. When Saul heard from Samuel these words, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as he does in obedience to his voice? To obey is better than sacrifice. To heed God's voice is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected and distorted God's word, he has rejected you as king. Saul's Time is up. He's finished. Samuel turns to leave, and Saul lunges for him, and he grabs his robe as if he could hold on to his power by holding on to Samuel. But the robe tears, and Saul is left with a chunk of robe in his hand, and Samuel says, this is the picture of what your life will be like from this moment on. The kingdom has been torn from you. You once had the perks of high office, but you'll have it no more. And then we know the story of David emerging as a national hero because of Goliath, and then Saul becomes very jealous of David, and that's the beginning of the end. And in 1 Samuel 16, 14, the scripture, the scripture says, Now the Spirit of God departed from Saul. Saul now ends up an abandoned, paranoid, desperate, and insane man, descending into witchcraft, into the world of the occult. And the Bible is so clear about warning us against it's a sad and tragic ending of a man who once stood tall, but he fell apart. When Saul died, David commanded Israel to weep. Remember, David loved Saul. And David now is king, commands Israel to weep. And why did they weep? Because Saul was a good man? No. They wept that Saul could have become something great, but he didn't. I love what Lisa said when she was up here earlier. We go and we care for people, not for who they are, but for who God could let them become. Mm -hmm. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the coming. Here's the application. Partial obedience <laughs> equals disobedience. Partial Faithfulness equals unfaithfulness. You understand that? Some of you might not agree. So if you're a man and a husband, ask your wife. 
It's partial faithfulness. It's not faithfulness. C.S. Lewis said that a little lie is like a little pregnancy. Pretty soon everybody knows. The truth is like a beach ball on a pool. You can try to push it under the water, but pretty soon it's going to pop up. Saul tried to conceal the truth. I was just getting this for God. Samuel says to Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. Bob Harris was weatherman for the New York TV station. Nationally syndicated network. He really wanted to make it badly. Though he'd studied math, physics, geology, he went to three colleges, he left without ever finishing a degree. He submitted an application that said he had his PhD, PhD in geophysics from Columbia University. That phony degree got him through the door. After a two month tryout, he was hired. He went on from there to be hired by the New York Times, as well as the baseball commissioner of Louis Kuhn, Ireland. 40 years of age, living his childhood dream. He found himself now in public disgrace and humiliation as someone sent an anonymous letter asking him to check his credentials. When they checked his credentials, they found the misrepresentation of truth. He lost his employment. The good news is, Grace gave him a second chance, but listen to what he said about the dreadful mistake. He said, I took a shortcut that turned out to be the long way around and one day the bill came due, and I will be sorry for as long as I live. Misrepresentation of truth is one of the distortions that is so, so destructive. How many of you knew that I have my Doctor of Theology degree? Mm -hmm. I've never made you call me Doctor ever before, but this has hung in my office for over 20 years. Uh, uh, Bob, this is from the school called the Scriptural Theological Seminary. <coughs> Bob, would you read right there who assigned it? Who's the first signature? Reverend H. I. Honors. Reverend H. I. Honors. High Honors. High, yeah, High Honors. And? D. 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 T. Okay, and who's the next signature? Uh, Dr. Salvation, Ph.D. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times people have sat in my office and said, Tim, when did you finish your doctorate? <laughs> they didn't look at it close enough. My father-in-law made this when Apple Computer first came out with the ability to make phony things look real. They had it and brought it to me. This is me. I, I have no PhD. You see, but we, 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 we can't, if we're not careful, misrepresent the truth, and then we misrepresent God. You see, you and I are God's representation to the world. We disobey God, we distort God to the world. When we are a phony, when we are conforming to the world standard, and when we distort the truth, we do a disservice to the one who is our Savior. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Dear Father, the story of Saul is a depressing, lower story scenario. But we're disobedient. It brings discouragement to our lives. I trust all of us can remember what's going on in the upper story. That this era of kings is going to be God's unfolding of a king who is yet to come. The one who will be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The king who one day would die for his subjects. The king who would one day be buried and would be raised again from the dead. The king that is now seated on the right hand of his father waiting to come again. But the next time he comes, this king will not come to save us. This king will come to take us all home. God, I pray that we will never forget who the king is, who God is. May we never forget the upper story perspective as we live in the lower story world. May we thank you, and may we seek your wisdom to live day by day. I pray that our lives lived in humble obedience would reflect who you are. And I trust this will be true about those who call New Hope home. I trust it will be true of my own life. May this be a place and may we be a people who are marked by continued humble obedience to you. And as you stand here this morning, if you recognize any phoniness or worldly conformity or misrepresentation of truth in your life, why don't you honestly confess it to him? Today, just as he did with Saul, he gives to you and to me by his grace fresh start, and a second chance. We can end well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Guys, in about two weeks, even though it's raining, you will be able to get